Amen. All right, so my sermon for this evening, I'm going to be, keep your place there in 1 Corinthians 6, flip back to this chapter 3, a couple pages to the left in your Bible. There's a phrase found in chapter 6 as well as in chapter 3 that I'm going to be preaching on tonight, and that's the, the temple of the Holy Ghost or the temple of God. Look at um, verse number 16 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible reads, Know ye not, verse number 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And I'm going to be preaching just on the temple of God, or the temple of the Holy Ghost, which the Bible says is our body. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in the New Testament, when a person is born again, right? You have a spirit that's born inside. That's why you're called born again, because the spirit that died the moment that you sin, the moment that you are accountable for your sins, because you have understanding, you know right from wrong, and you choose to sin, just as Adam and Eve, the day that they ate thereof of the fruit that God said not to eat thereof, he says, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. They died, even though they didn't die physically, they died spiritually, and that happened with their first transgression. With their first sin, they died spiritually. Well, the same thing happens to everybody with their first sin in this world that God holds them responsible for when, when you know, and I'm not going to get into the, that topic of knowing exactly when that is for each individual. It's outside the scope of sermon, but whenever that happens, your spirit dies, right? Because when you're created, you have a spirit that's alive. So children in the womb, for example, have a spirit that is not dead. And when they die, if a baby dies in the womb, they still go to heaven. They didn't need to receive that salvation for their sins because they didn't sin yet. They haven't done anything wrong, right? And we believe that, that children that die go straight to be with the Lord. They don't spend, you know, God doesn't pick and choose some of them to go to hell and some of them go to heaven for some arbitrary reason or whatever. That is not the God of the Bible. But when we get saved, that spirit revives. So that dead spirit that died because of sin is revived. It's brought back to life again. That's that second birth. That's that spiritual birth. But in addition to that, as believers in Jesus Christ in the New Testament, God has given us the Holy Ghost also, that indwells us as believers. And this is something that was different compared to the Old Testament, where, yes, people in the Old Testament were born again, just like Adam was, just like everyone else throughout history has been born again by putting their faith in the Lord or in Jesus Christ for us, right? Um, that is no different. Just, and, and when Jesus was explaining this to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he says, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not thou these things? So he's basically, you know, saying, you know, being born again wasn't a new concept. He's like, how can you not know these things? You're a master of Israel. How, how can you say that you study the word of God, that you're this Pharisee, and you don't even know what it means to be born again? How can you not know this? It wasn't some brand new doctrine that he conjured up that's just like, oh, now people are born again with the Spirit. No, it's always been that way. People have always been saved the same way. It's always been by grace through faith. And you get born again the moment you believe but what we also have now is the, the Holy Ghost, when Jesus breathed on his disciples after his resurrection and they received the Holy Ghost, they received that indwelling of the Holy Ghost, which now every believer has, okay? And the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of taking a little bit of time to break this down just to make sure everyone's really clear on what happens here is because it's not just our soul or our spirit residing within our bodies, we have to recognize that as a believer, the Holy Ghost comes and resides within us as well. And our bodies now, because the Holy Ghost comes to reside with us, our bodies are that temple, that place, that home for the Holy Ghost to be inhabiting while we're here on this earth. And it's just one more reason, one more thing to think about when we consider, you know, 
making decisions in our life they're going to impact our bodies and we need to to be cognizant of the fact that the holy ghost as a believer is residing within you and god puts a very you know stern warning to us in the bible look down again we'll reread these verses verses 16 and 17 first corinthians chapter 3 know ye not that ye so you you people are the temple of god and that the spirit of god dwelleth in you god's spirit dwells in you if you're saved if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So God's saying, don't mess with your body, with the temple of the Holy Ghost, because God will destroy you for that. Now, he's not talking about just sending you to hell, but there are plenty of believers that have lost their lives, and for various reasons, but he's, t he's warning here, saying don't mess with your body because, you know, God will destroy you. And there's many ways that you can mess with your body and you can transgress against that temple of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to go into, a, you know, mo many of those this evening. And that's kind of going to be the focus here, is focusing on sins or things that we can do that's going to end up defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost. And 1 Corinthians 6, if you want to go back there, the, the context here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to end up seeing almost the same exact phrases being used about our body being temple of the Holy Ghost, has to do with fornication. So any sin that is of a, you know, of a sexual nature, of something where you're going to be joined with someone else, you know, you think about that union, and the Bible's talking about, hey, when you commit fornication, you're transgressing against your own body, and don't you know that you're supposed to keep your body holy and sanctified and separate because the Holy Ghost is residing there? And when you're going to take your body and join yourself to someone else and join yourself in fornication or join yourself in adultery, you know, how can you do such a thing understanding and knowing that the Holy Ghost is residing within you? Amen. At the very moment that you go and commit an act like that, you are defiling the temple that the Holy Ghost is residing in. And that's something that you need to keep in mind. Let's read this passage again here in verse number 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible reads, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication but for the Lord and the Lord for the body and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power look at verse 15 know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ so our very bodies are the members of Christ shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot God forbid. What's a harlot? A harlot is a whore, a hooker, a prostitute. That's what a harlot is. And he's saying, am I going to take the members of Christ? I mean, God's own body, Christ's own body, and, and make them one with a hooker? Make them one with a prostitute and just bring down your body so low to be joined unto, you know, a, a, a harlot? God forbid. Verse 16, what know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. So when you, when you have that union of a man and woman coming together, the Bible is talking about you're becoming one flesh. And you are joining those two bodies together. And if you, if you have, if you're saved, you got the Holy Ghost residing within you, and you have that union outside of marriage whether it be fornication or adultery, that is a, a, a very, you know, an unlawful union, and that is one that is going to result in a, in a, I mean, here, the, the stern warning that we get here is God warning about destroying people that defile the temple of God because you're defiling your body when you commit fornication and adultery, and especially for the young people, or, you know, and the married people, too. Adultery, fornication is very serious, you need to be worried as a, as a believer of what God's going to do to bring judgment on you if you're going to go out knowing these things, knowing how God feels about them, and then just go and deliberately, you know, join your body with, with, with someone else, 
in fornication and in adultery, you know, I'd be worried that God was going to strike me down knowing this is the temple of the Holy Ghost and I'm just going to go and defile this temple. The Bible says in verse number 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Flee means run away screaming from fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Look at verse number 19, and this is the same, almost exactly the same as what we read in chapter 3. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our body and our spirit belongs to God. God purchased us. God has redeemed us when he saved our souls from hell, when we put our trust in Jesus Christ and we became born again, we became his children, he bought us. We belong to him. This body that you inhabit, that you possess, that God created and gave to you, guess what? That doesn't belong to you. And sorry, you know, the, the, the murderous women and men that want to support my body, my choice, and want to murder babies that are growing inside of the womb. It's not your body. It's not yours. No matter how much you think it is, it's not yours. You're bought with a price. And even the people that, that aren't saved, you know, Jesus still paid for their, for their salvation, whether or not they've received it or not is another thing, but it's still not yours. It's not yours to do what you want. And you know what? That baby is a separate body. That's not your body. That's their body. So why don't you let the baby make you? I don't think the baby's going to go, yeah, kill me. Kill me. I don't want to live. <coughs> Good luck trying to get consent from the, from the baby, right, that the baby wants to be murdered. Do you want to be murdered? We are bought with a price. And, and this, these verses here, obviously, uh, that's why I wanted to start with chapter 3, because chapter 6, the whole context is fornication. And that's the first sin that, that it needs to be recognized when you're sinning against the temple of the Holy Ghost is, is that fornication, that union. But there are other sins that we could commit when you consider that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That this, this body you inhabit doesn't belong to you. We need to be able to take care for our bodies and not get involved in sins that are going to defile the body because we are supposed to be glorifying God not only in our spirit, right? Not only with the things that you say and, and how you live, but in your body also. Your body should be representative and bringing glory unto God. And when you go around and whore around, that's defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost and is not bring any glory or honor unto the Lord. What about... Um, and this is another one of the reasons why, you know, I believe that, that smoking cigarettes is a sin. You're not going to find references to smoking tobacco in the Bible. It's not there. Okay, we have lots of other principles that we use, but this is how we understand when we make choices in your life and say, well, I don't know, is this right or wrong? You have to look at the principles. You know, one of the foundational principles for determining whether or not we should be putting harmful, you know, toxic substances into our body is understanding your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. So when you understand that, we shouldn't be doing anything that's going to be bringing harm and damage unto our own bodies if we're supposed to glorify God in our bodies. Why are you going to be introducing, you know, cancer-causing agents and tars and chemicals and all kinds of stuff into your system when you, you're supposed to be the, you know, the temple of the Holy Ghost. How is that glorifying unto the Lord? Same thing with drugs, right? Drugs are poisonous for your body. The reason why you have whatever um, reactions, the, the way, you know, the feelings of euphoria and these other feelings that you get physically in your body is your body trying to deal with this toxic chemical that's coming into your system. And yeah, it messes with you, but it's not, I mean, it's poison. It's not good stuff that, that's, you know, healthy vitamins that are coming in your body that are making you feel good. No, it's your body dealing with poisons. They're actually not good for you. They're destroying brain cells. They're destroying 
other parts of your body. They're destroying your kidneys and your liver, trying to process all this, the, the harmful stuff that you're ingesting, you know, from alcohol to whatever. Think about um, drinking alcohol. It defiles your liver, which is part of your body. It defiles your mind. Turn, if you would, to uh, Proverbs 23, very famous passage on drinking alcohol. Everybody's familiar with the term being intoxicated, right? When someone's drunk, inebriated, or called intoxicated. Well, if you think about that word intoxicated, you got the word toxic right in the middle. <laughs> Serious, think about it. Next time you hear the word, you, you talk about someone being intoxicated, just focus in on that word toxic. There's something to remember, you know, when you want to take that, that, that drink that beer or, or do that shot or whatever, or someone's trying to, to get you to, to get drunk with them and to go drink, it's toxic. It's poison. It's not good for you. It's going to damage your body. It's going to defile the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's going to damage your liver. That's why people get cirrhosis. That's why people get these other diseases from drinking alcohol and drinking booze. Where your body's trying to process these toxic chemicals, these toxic elements through your body. It's not honoring God, but it doesn't just stop with your body. It also defiles your mind. The Bible reads in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken, and shalt make thyself naked. When you drink booze, when you get drunk, it's correlated with people having, you know, doing very shameful acts. It's a shame to just go around and just be naked. Right? I don't think anyone, there's a reason why everyone comes to church dressed, right? Or goes anywhere out in public dressed because you know it's a shame to go out and be seen naked of people. Well, you know what happens when you get drunk? I mean, doesn't it sound like so much fun when you get drunk? People start taking their clothes off in public. It happens. I mean, look, it's, it's not like people are just stripping down naked everywhere, but people do a lot of things that normally they wouldn't do because they understand that it's a shame. And when you start getting drunk, that goes out the window. And it defiles your body. You're going to make yourself naked. In Proverbs 23, we see more um, damage that's caused by alcohol, by getting drunk. Verse number 29 in Proverbs 23, the Bible says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. I want to focus in on that wounds without cause. You know, our bodies are supposed to be a temple of the Holy Ghost. Do you think it's a good idea just to be going out and being reckless with your body to end up getting wounds, to getting damage done to your body, and you don't even know why? I mean, obviously, accidents happen. You're doing work. You get cut. Okay, understandable. You're doing something that, that you'd be supposed to be doing, but you're not supposed to just be reckless with your bodies and just getting wounds. Eh, who knows how I even got that wound? I don't know. Going off and, and being foolish and getting drunk. That is not honoring to God also, but jump down to verse number 33, because as I mentioned before, it doesn't just defile your body physically, it defiles your mind. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. The sin of getting drunk and drinking alcohol and being given over to, to booze and drunkenness, I mean, the Bible is literally saying your heart is going to be perverted. Your heart's going to utter perverse things. You, you know what's a shame? It's a shame for someone to call you a pervert. Isn't it? I mean, does, that, does anyone here want to be called a pervert? No. no. You label people perverts who are perverts, but you know what the Bible's saying here? That your heart is going to start uttering things that a pervert, a pervert would say when you get drunk. That's going to lead your heart into a perverted place that you don't want to be. You know, predators out there that are trying to defile people, sodomites are not. Predators, they oftentimes are going to use alcohol to try to defile people because they want to lower your inhibitions. They want to they get you in a frame of mind where you're not thinking rationally and normally. And also, they get drunk themselves, 
and their heart heart starts uttering perverse things and they start doing perverted things stay away from alcohol i can't stress this enough i appreciate it many times this is just one aspect though let's move on from drunkenness turn to deuteronomy chapter 21 because the overall theme that we're, that we're looking at tonight is just your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. So we need to look at all the different decisions you can make that are going to impact your body and consider, you know, hey, I mean, if you think about, just going back to alcohol for a second, your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost, when you go out and get drunk, you know, it's common for people to, to vomit, to throw up, to, to, to be just in an environment that's filthy. Not only are you defiling your own body with the poison that you're ingesting, but then, you know, your mind and everything else being in that environment is defiling, and you ought to have more respect for the Holy Ghost than to bring the, drag the Holy Ghost around with you into filthy environments um, and disregard, and, and you know, and you shouldn't be disregarding the your body that's a temple. But how about this one? Is Deuteronomy 21, look at verse number 20. The Bible reads, And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard, and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones, that he die, so shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. One of the sins that's often tied with, with drunkenness is gluttony. It doesn't mean, mean to be a glutton. It means that you're overindulging in food. Right? It's bad. It's a sin. It's wicked to overindulge in booze and alcohol to get drunk. Right? Your heart's going to utter perverse things. But you know what? Oftentimes people who overindulge in that will also overindulge in eating. And I'm telling you, you know, this this is something that, that I think everyone, especially because we live in a society that, that we are very wealthy in general overall, especially in comparison to other countries and other people, and just throughout history, you look at how much wealth that we have, it's easier for people to become gluttonous and to indulge in things just because it's so convenient, it's so easy, you have prosperity. It's an easy sin to be part of. You can say, yeah, I'm not getting involved with, with, with drugs and alcohol. I get that, you know, I'm going to do what's right. And as I mentioned this morning, you know, there's many things that in and of themselves aren't sinful. There's nothing bad or wrong with it. Eating food, it's something we all have to do. There's nothing wrong with eating food, right? But it does become sinful when you overindulge in food, when you overindulge in things that are going to make you fat, that are going to destroy your body, that are not healthy for you, when you start introducing things that are just bad for you, you know, you have to be able to draw a line and say, this is not good for the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pay more attention to what I'm allowing myself to ingest and, and you know, what it's going to do to my body. You don't want to destroy yourself physically. And it's so easy to do it. And, and look, this is, this is the balance you have to strike. Yes, there's convenience. Yes, there's fast food. Yeah, there's things that, oh man, I need to keep doing this and this and this. But don't get so distracted with all that that you start, you know, defiling your own body and not giving the proper respect to your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost and being able to, and, and think about it too. Obviously, it just makes sense. You want to stay in the best health that you can so you have the most years that you can live to do the most work for the Lord. It's not going to do anyone any good if, you know, yeah, you could be real busy getting stuff done now, but if you're just filling yourself full of junk and become gluttonous in eating food, that's going to that's gonna cut your lifespan short. It is going to It is going to impact your health. And the other problem is, too, is that when you give yourself over to anything, it's, the, it's not usually going to just stop with that one thing. When you have an attitude or, or a, an area of your life that you overindulge, no matter what you're overindulging in, it's going to bleed over into other parts of your body. That's why we see you know, gluttony and drunkenness are tied together so closely when you find references to gluttony in the Bible. You're always going to find that tied in, almost always, I think always, tied in with drunkenness. Because once you're, you're kind of, you know, you're giving yourself over the food. The next thing is, is, is the drink as well. Um, 
we, we need to be able to control ourselves and be temperate and not give in to the lusts of the flesh. Flip over, well, you're in, you're in Deuteronomy 21. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I'll read from Proverbs 23. I know we were just there, but earlier in the chapter, in verse 20 of Proverbs 23, the Bible reads, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. So in the same passage that's warning about drunkenness, warning about alcohol, and not being among wine-bibbers, it, it puts in the same verse, wine-bibbers and riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Eating and drinking too much both have severely negative impacts on your body. And oftentimes, I mean, with both of these, it's going to make you lazy. When you start getting, you know, overindulgent in food, it's going to make you not have enough energy to do things. It actually is counterproductive when you have, to, you know, obviously we're supposed to eat to get energy, right? To be able to get us through the day, to, to, to do the work that we need to do. But when you start adding more and more on top of that, it actually is, is, is counterproductive. Instead of giving you energy, it's going to be taking your energy away from you, and people end up getting uh, more slothful that are getting drunk all the time and more slothful that are eating and overindulging in food too much. You end up not doing the work that you should, and as a result, you're going to come to poverty because you're not <laughs> working the way that you ought to be working. It says, in drowsiness shall close a man with rags. People get lazy and they don't work when you give yourself over to food and drink. You're in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, Verse number 16, the Bible reads, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. So you say, what in the world? Why, why would we be in woe? Why, why would the land be in woe? Now, I can understand when you say, when thy king is a child, right? Because you, you want to have a, you know, someone who's grown and mature and has wisdom to, to rule and to lead. It says, but then it says, and thy princes eat in the morning. You say, well, I eat in the morning. What does that have to do? Well, the next verse is going to explain more, more what this is talking about with eating in the morning. Verse 17 says, Blessed art thou, this is the contrast, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So the purpose of eating is to provide you with that strength that you need for the day. I mean, if you're eating for strength because you're going to go and you're going to do some work and you're, you know, you're getting that food in you and you're going to go and work, that's right, that's just, that's good. But when you're just eating because you have abundance and you're not going to go off and work anyways, you're just, well, I'm just going to wake up and eat because I can and then I'm going to eat again and eat again, that's where you're going to have the problems. That's going to lead to the slothfulness, which is verse number 18. It says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. So, you know, what happens is you have these kings, right? Because they're talking about kings in Ecclesiastes here, chapter 10. You know, when a king is the son of nobles, and, you know, the noble people, people who have established themselves, work, built up, you know, whatever, they, they have a good work ethic, they have wisdom, and they're eating because they just need strength. As opposed to these kids that are just, well, we're just going to eat. We're just going to be uh, gluttonous in our eating. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So far, we've seen, you know, our temple being, our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. You have to watch out for fornication, alcohol, and overindulging in food, right? Gluttony, drunkenness, these are all sins that impact your body, and you need to remember, hey, my body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. We don't want to defile our bodies in the sight of God, especially in all these ways. But the next thing we're going to look at is part of our body, 1 Corinthians 11, talks about even just the length of your hair. And bring a dishonor. You're supposed to be glorifying God with your body. How about even how you're you say, why? God doesn't care about my hair. Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. 
Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So the, the establishment here, the beginning of the passage, is explaining who the head is, who's the boss, right? Who are you giving honor and respect unto? The head of every man is Christ. And then he starts off with the man saying, if you pray, pray or prophesy with your head covered, you dishonor your head. So who are you dishonoring? You're dishonoring Christ. When you're praying or prophesying with your head covered, now we're going to get into that covering real soon here. It's going to be real ex uh, explicit what the Bible is referring to. It's not talking just about some hat, right, like a baseball cap or something like that, that never comes up in this passage one time. It's ex extremely clear what the covering is when you just go off of biblical context and not want it to say something else, even if... You might read this passage and think, the first thought that comes to your mind, oh, having my head covered, you might think of a hat, right? Just on, on first glance of reading this, until you keep reading and get the context. It's real clear what he's talking about. So when you pray or prophesy with your head uncovered, head covered, excuse me, as a man, you're dishonoring your head, which is Christ. It says, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So the woman that has her head uncovered, like the man is supposed to have his head uncovered, that is um, a dishonor for her head. Who's her head? Her husband. It's a shame for the husband when the woman is praying or prophesying with her head uncovered. Verse 6, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. So, <laughs> well, we'll get into that in just a minute. Shorn meaning shaven, right? Your head, your head's just, just shaved. Like, let, just let all of her hair be shaved then. If the woman's not covered, then just let it all be shaved. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Verse number 13, we're going to start getting more clarity on the covering. <coughs> Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Her hair is given her for a covering. We just read about your head being covered, your head being uncovered. He's talking about your hair. And, and <laughs> it boggles my mind. I mean, I, I, that's just how blind people are that are not saved. Amen. That you have groups of people that actually think that, no, 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 this is talking about a head. I mean, you know, women have to be wearing bonnets when they, when they come in the church, and, you know, otherwise they're, they're dishonoring, and, and, you know, men can't wear any hats. That's not what this is talking about at all. I just said her hair is giving her for a covering. That's, that's what she has. And if she have long hair, it's a glory. Amen. That's a good thing. But if men have long hair, it's a shame. Even nature tells you that. Even little children. Look, I knew this as a child growing up when you can see a guy that you don't know is a guy walking down the street and you think it's a woman. You say, excuse me, ma'am, and then they turn around and they got a beard. And you're like, whoa. Uh, yeah, okay, you know, that's a shame. It's a shame to be referenced, you know, as something you're not. There's nothing wrong with women, but if you're a guy, there's something wrong with someone calling you a woman, right? And vice versa. You know, it's shameful for a woman to be, to be mistaken for a man. Just as much as it's shameful for a man to be mistaken as a woman. And you don't have to believe the Bible to understand that that's true, okay? <laughs> that's... That's, that's where it says nature itself teaches you this. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. It's a shame for a woman to have short hair because that means that your head isn't covered properly. Yes, God cares. We just read 15 verses. 
about this subject. Okay, now, in verse 3, it talked about the head of, of the woman, the head of the man, and Christ being the head. Well, if our body is supposed to be the temple of the Holy Ghost and we're supposed to glorify God in our body, wouldn't we be glorifying God then by respecting what the Bible says about our hair length? Right? right? Men, short hair, women, long hair. It's that simple. Okay, and I don't want to go on and on. I could <laughs> preach, I've preached entire sermons on all of these subjects before pretty much because that you can go more in depth on this, but we're just kind of doing a cursory of just thinking, okay, we're talking about our bodies being a temple of the Holy Ghost. Let's honor the Holy Ghost, and let's look at various things that we can do that's going to dishonor that temple of the Holy Ghost, which is your body. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Another way to defile the temple of the Holy Ghost, to defile your body, is by printing marks on your body, a.k.a. tattoos. Yes, I believe that tattoos are sinful. That it is, you are breaking God's command when you print tattoos on your body. And I don't care what the tattoo is a picture of, what it represents, what you're marking on your body. Any marks that you're making on your body is sinful according to Scripture. And we're going to see the verse that proves this. Leviticus 19, we're going to start reading verse number 27. The Bible reads, You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So before we get to the tattoos, this is, you know, I went over this already before uh, last week. But again, with your hair and making really stupid haircuts and making yourself look foolish by, by shaving off parts and, and rounding the corners of your heads and doing different things with your head, that's dishonoring to your head. It's dishonoring to God when you defile the temple, Holy Ghost, even in that way. But verse 28 says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. You see, well, yeah, but Pastor Burns says for the dead. Well, I'm not doing it for the dead. Okay, well then, why don't you keep reading the rest of the verse, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. It doesn't say nor print any marks on you for the dead. It says nor don't print any marks on you, right? Don't make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. That's one thing. Nor print any marks upon you. Printing marks. I mean, do you, do you know what happens when you're, <laughs> when you're getting a tattoo and they take that pen and they heat it up and you've got that ink and it's, and it's being burned, in, etched into your skin? You're, you're printing a mark on your body. Okay, and it, I mean, it's, it's that simple. Now look, if, you know, people who have tattoos, I don't, I don't hate people who have tattoos, but I'm going to preach the Bible, the Bible says it's a sin. I don't hate people that commit fornication, but you know it's a sin. And if you're a believer in God, you shouldn't be committing fornication. And if you're a believer in God, you shouldn't be getting tattoos on your flesh either. Right. Obviously, if you've already done something, if you've already committed fornication, if you've already gotten tattoos, there's nothing you can do about it. It's done. But you know what? I'm not going to worry about your feelings being hurt because you've sinned in the past. It's more important that people understand what the Bible says so that going forward, hey, I'm not going to do that anymore. Unfortunately, we got too many preachers that, that are afraid to say, oh, i got so many people in my congregation that have tattoos. I don't want to preach on that. So, so just let them go get more tattoos, right? Let them never hear the truth and never understand and just bring the wrath of God on them because they're going to go off and defile the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's better, right? Wait, what did the Bible say in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. How about we be careful about not defiling the temple of God, which is your body, in context, what the Scripture is saying. Why don't we take consideration for our bodies so that we could glorify God and not do the things that God has told us not to do? How about piercings? Now, the Bible talks about uh, you know, piercings are, are, have gotten weird. <laughs> I know there's no new thing under the sun. People have done things like this before. But, you know, it, it should go without saying that people who mutilate their bodies, you're defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
when you start doing all these weird things and making holes in places and, and doing all that, that's not a good thing. Now, I'm gonna just deal specifically with like earrings because this is the, the most common aspect of our culture, even though other things have gotten to be more common. What we see, what I see when I study the Bible when it comes to things like earrings, right? Because a, a lot of women like to pierce their ears. I don't see earrings in and of themselves being a bad thing when women are wearing earrings. I don't. I see it being referred to in a, either in a neutral fashion or even in a positive fashion with women. When you, when you study out all the times you mention of earrings in the scripture, there's, there's, there never seems to be any indication that there's anything wrong with women having earrings. Okay, now we're, we're going to get into a little bit more detail on that in a minute. But just an example, because I'm not going to go through every example in Scripture. Not a lot of them. You could do the study on your own. But um, in Genesis 24, we have Abraham's servant meeting um, Rebekah and bringing gifts to her, basically, and giving her some jewelry to come, you know, to, to come back to be uh, Isaac's wife. And one of the things he gives her is an earring. It says in Genesis 24, verse 30, And it came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah's sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. So, you know, it's just, it's just referring to her receiving his earrings. He's bringing them to her. There's nothing, like, bad or, you know, any negative connotation with that. There's other places in Scripture basically talking about the same thing. But I do believe that the Bible speaks very negatively about men who would wear earrings and get their ears pierced and, and wear this jewelry in their ears. In Genesis 35, turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Judges chapter 8. Judges 8. I'm going to read a couple passages for you as to, to prove why I believe that it's not right for men to have earrings. Genesis 35, verse 2, the Bible reads, Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. This is where Jacob's getting right with God, and getting his whole household and his family right, and saying, hey, look, we need to shape back up. We're getting right with God. So he's saying, get rid of these strange gods, right? You're changing your garments. They weren't dressed right. They're, they're getting sanctified. He says, And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So in their getting right with God, and changing their garments, and getting rid of the false gods, they also delivered earrings unto him. So when you think about it in context, well, there's got to be something wrong with them having these earrings. Now, you could say, well, maybe they were representing these false gods or something. Okay, maybe. Maybe. Unlikely. I think there's more to it than just that. I think it has to do with the earrings themselves, not, not being what they were images of or anything, that, but actually just that they had earrings. But we can see a reference of the earrings being included with the false gods as being, when they get right with God, they're getting rid of them. Exodus 32, when the people basically want to have nothing to do with Moses anymore, and they make their, their idols, I'll read this for you. In verse number 1, the Bible says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not what has become of him? And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. So what we're seeing here is that it was more common for them at this time for their, their wives, sons, and daughters have earrings, but we don't see like grown men having it. Now, I don't think sons should have them at all. This isn't saying this is right or wrong, but we're just seeing who had the earrings when they break them off and they give them to Aaron for him to make a calf with, to make an idol out of. And it's interesting that they're just bringing this to him. Now, again, this isn't like, like, like the, the, the proof of, oh, see, here, look, this proves that earrings are wrong on guys. That's not what I'm, I'm just, it's just, it's, it's this extra, um, just one more little piece of the puzzle 
that you can look to and add together. But Judges chapter 8, I think, has one of the most uh, convincing texts that can prove why men should be wearing earrings in, in conjunction with the, the children of, of Jacob getting right with God. Judges 8, 24, the Bible reads, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. And then it says, For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So there's this battle, right, where men are fighting with men. And when, they, when the children of Israel were victorious in this battle over the heathen, they're stripping them of all their valuables, right? They go in and spoil them. So these, these men have died, and they're getting anything that's valuable, and they're, and they're taking those goods. And one of the things that they've, they received were these earrings. And then explains, well, why did they have these earrings? It says, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites were not, were not, you know, the children of God. They were, um, you know, born, and they're, they're always representative of the heathen, of people who are wicked, of people who are ungodly. The ungodly people, it explains here, oh, they had earrings because they were Ishmaelites. That's why they had them. Meaning, it wasn't for the children of God, for the men to have earrings in their ears. Yeah, they had them, but that's because they're Ishmaelites. Men of the world have them today. That's because they're heathen, right? But that should be why. It shouldn't be because they're a child of God and dishonor God in your body, which is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And then the last place uh, I'm going to have you turn to look at here is, well, we're going to look at 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Peter chapter 3, the last two passages. 1 Timothy 2 and then 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're regarding our body as a temple of the Holy Ghost. We looked at the things that we put into our body, food, right, drink. We looked at how we deal with our body, with like fornication and adultery. What's on your head with your hair, part of your body. And then adorning yourself, first with earrings and now with just the rest of your clothing. The Bible teaches even how we ought to be dressed. And I didn't, this wasn't in my notes, but, um, you know, the Bible teaches that it's, that it's an abomination for the man to put on a woman's garment, for the woman to wear that which pertaineth to a man. I, I didn't even have this, but, it was, you know, but it, it's perfectly applicable. If you want to honor the Holy Ghost, if you want to honor the Holy Spirit that's residing within you, to honor Him by wearing what pertains to either a woman or a man. And not just wearing what pertains to a woman or a man in church, but how about just every day of your life? How about recognizing that it's not like the Holy Spirit's entering your body when you walk through the doors at church and then leaving your body when you go home. How about realizing that the Holy Ghost is with you every day of your life? And if you're going to honor the Holy Ghost and the temple of, of the Holy Ghost, which is your body, then you ought to be consistent every day of your life in bringing honor unto the Holy Ghost. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So the Bible teaches for women, you know, that you're supposed to dress modestly. Modest means you're not drawing attention to yourself. And there's many ways you can draw attention to yourself. One way for women to draw attention to themselves is to wear clothing that's really form-fitting and not leaving much to the imagination for a man to lust after their flesh. That's drawing attention to yourself. You know what? That's immodest and that's wicked and wrong and you ought not to do that. But another way to do so is not necessarily by using your body to draw eyes upon you, but also the things that you put on, like the jewelry, okay? The gold, the flashy things, and the sparkly stuff to draw eyes on you, that's immodest. So 
you know, this is the perfect segue from the earring saying, you know, I don't think it's necessarily wrong for a woman, but you know what, it would be wrong when they're just real flashy and just trying to draw more attention on you. It's one thing to adorn yourself in a way where you can look nice and presentable and whatever, but it's another thing to be drawing attention onto you and just kind of stealing that focus. That is immodest. And that's why the Bible brings up broided hair, gold, pearls, and costly, you know, the real expensive stuff. Oh, wow, is that a, you know, what, I, don't even, I don't even know what the name brand stuff is anymore. I'm so, you know, out of that, I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell you an example of what would be considered um, costly array anymore these days. But um, that's what the Bible teaches, you know. And again, how you're adorning your body is going to either bring honor or dishonor unto the Lord. First Peter chapter 3, along the same lines here, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So, um, again, you know, the Bible's talking about multiple things obviously the the physical aspect of not worrying about you know being modest and not drawing attention to yourself but then also the the right spirit that you should have we ought to to just you know the, the whole point of my sermon tonight is to to drive home the idea that your body is a temple of the holy ghost you know you're saved you've got the holy ghost residing in you treat your body as the temple of the holy ghost try to make sure you could get yourself healthy. Make sure you're not doing things that bring toxic chemicals and toxic things into your body. Stay away from adultery and fornication. Stay away from drugs and alcohol and booze and cigarettes and everything else is going to destroy your body. Have respect unto God. Have respect that you are housing the Holy Ghost with your body. And remember that when you leave and you start making choices to do things and just to eat things and whatever it is, you know, be aware of that and think, Wow, am I really just polluting and defiling the, the, the temple of the Holy Ghost that, that, that the Holy Ghost is residing in? Or am I actually going to show honor and try to be presentable with my body, um, which is the temple of the Holy Ghost? All right, let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, giving us all the wisdom that you give us in your word. I pray that you please help us to be mindful of, of treating our bodies appropriately the way that you would have them to be, that we can um, bring honor and glory unto your name, and that um, we can live a, a holy and sanctified life as you'd have us to live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, let's turn to one last song before we're dismissed.